to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. For the people had a mind to work. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 6. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is all about the rebuilding and the restoration of Israel and their nation and their worship back to where God wants it to be. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study of the fascinating book of Nehemiah. We hope that you've got your Bible. If not, that you'll locate it as we look to the Word of God in our practical study today. As always, this lesson is being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Lord's Church in your area. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship service, whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or for Wednesday Bible study. You'll find people there who love God, who are friendly and kind, and who are concerned first and foremost about what does the Bible say and helping people understand and know God's will. And so visit the Lord's Church in your area, also here at the Gospel of Christ. We'd love to help you in your study and your journey to know God and His Word better. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of good Bible study material. It's all available free of charge. You can access it anytime. We've got lessons on every book in the Old Testament, every book in the New Testament, and a plethora of topical Bible studies, and they're available to you anytime free of charge. You can fill out a media request form and we can give you a digital download of that, or if you'd like to have a DVD or a CD copy of that, written transcript, we can mail those to you as well. Just contact us at the information given. We'd be glad to help you in your study of the Word of God. And of course, check out our mobile apps for Android and iPhone. Those are available from the respective marketplaces, and it's a great way to study the Word of God in our fast-paced world today. We're thinking about the book of Nehemiah today. And Nehemiah is a fascinating book of the people of Israel after they have returned from captivity. Here's kind of the, the backdrop to understanding the book. Due to their sin, their idolatry, their infidelity, uh, the Jews were eventually taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar under the Babylonians according to the will of God, Jeremiah 29 and Jeremiah chapter 25. During the last deportation of the Jews in 586, much of the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, leveled. The temple of Solomon and the walls around the city were all broken down and destroyed. 2 Kings 25 records that for us. However, in 539, Persia overcame Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar was forced out of control. In the year 536, just as God had promised, and I, last verse of Isaiah 44 and the first verse of Isaiah 45 verse 1 and in Ezra 1 1, in the year 536, Cyrus the Persian, the Medes and the Persian, he comes to rule and he gives this decree allowing all the Jews from captivity to go back home to rebuild their city, to rebuild their walls, to restore their worship. And with a thankful and glad heart, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they do just that. And just as the Jews kind of left in three deportations, they also kind of return in three different ways. You've got Zerubbabel and the people who return, and the city and the temple uh, is restored. Under the book of Ezra, you've got Ezra and the people, and the law and morality is restored. And now... In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah returns with a group of people and the walls and the gate of Jerusalem is built back up. In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah led the people to do in a few days what they'd not done in 13 years. What did Nehemiah do? to encourage these people to be such hard workers for God? And, and what practical lessons can we learn today? And as we said earlier, 
one of the key verses and a key statement idea is found in Nehemiah 4 verse 6. The people had a mind to work. You know, when God's people have a mind to work, there isn't anything we can't do with God's help. All things are possible with God. Luke chapter 1 teaches us, and we can do all things through Christ. Philippians 4 verse 13. One of the key phrases that we'll hear in this book is chapter 2 verse 18. They say, let us rise up and build. And so they've got a mind to work. They're ready to get their hands dirty. And the Word of God is going to be restored back in chapter 8. And thus, when God's people have a mind to work, there is going to be success in the kingdom of God. All right, let's kind of take some practical lessons, a little snapshot of the book of Nehemiah with a practical eye toward today from some of the lessons we can learn. What are some of the living messages of Nehemiah? Nehemiah recognized the power of prayer in everyday life. I want you to look at a few verses with me. Look in Nehemiah chapter 1. And we're just going to real quickly look at these. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible says, They prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse number 4, the Bible says, I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse number 4, Hear our God for we are despised, Nehemiah says. And in Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 19, Nehemiah says, Remember me, O my God. For good. When, when, when a challenge arises, when difficulty occurs, when, when Nehemiah needs help or encouragement, Nehemiah turns to God in prayer. And friend, what a powerful lesson that is for everyday life. To be the best servant I can be. To fully give myself to God. To really be a worker for the Lord. Friend, I've got to have God's help. I cannot do it alone. I need to utilize the power of prayer. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.16, we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. We know the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Daniel prayed and God heard his prayer. Ezra and Nehemiah prayed. God heard their prayer and God knows what we need before we ask it. And he says, cast all your cares upon me. I care for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 7. And so who are people who are really going to do great things for God? People with a mind to work. People with a heart of prayer. Are we going to approach God's throne in prayer and ask his help? Then there's this practical lesson that I'd like for you to consider with me. I want each of us today, as we think about what's going on in Nehemiah, and as the people ponder this, I want us to be reminded how good God's been to us. Look in Nehemiah chapter 2, and I want you to notice what's said in verse number 8. Why were the people so happy, so joyous, so have such a heart for working? A letter was sent to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, for the house that I'll occupy. And watch this now. And the king granted them to me according, listen to this phrase, according to the good hand of my God upon me. Just like Nehemiah, have, God, hasn't God been so good to us? Ephesians 1 verse 3. Every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. You remember James 1.17? Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. The Lord's mercies are new every morning toward us. Friend, I want you to think about in your own life, personally speaking, think about how God's been so good to you how He's taken care of you, how He sent His Son to die for your sins, how that you have the, the hope and the joy of heaven, and one day we can be reunited with all the, those who have gone before us. God has been so good to every one of us, and we need to be reminded of that powerful truth. But friend, just like in the book of Ezra, let's realize there are always going to be enemies of God's people. You can do right, you can live right, you can try to live a good life, but there are always going to be people who don't like that. Notice chapter 2. I want you to see what happens in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 10. The Bible says, When Sanballat the Horonite 
Tobiah the Ammonite official, the Ammonite official heard of it. They were deeply disturbed. Watch this. They were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Why was he so disturbed with that? He didn't respect God. He didn't like the Israelites. And because he had heard all the stories about when Israel was faithful to God, what happened to their enemies? What happened to the, to the Egyptians? When they tried to, when they didn't, when Pharaoh didn't submit to God, when they still tried to pursue God's people, God brought the Red Sea down on them, the Amalekites, the, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all those nations. God conquered them. When His people put their trust in them, Friend, it's bad news for the enemies of God's people. But realize this. There's always been enemies of God's people. And our responsibility in that is simply to stay true to God and do what He wants us to do. The ultimate enemy, of course, is Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The devil is going to do everything possible to discourage you, to get you off track, to deaden you. He'll do everything possible. Don't let him. And then there are also enemies of what's right. There are people today who don't want to see God's church, God's family, the gospel, right living, stand up in an immoral and ungodly age. People don't like that. But again, our responsibility just like the people in Nehemiah, let's stay with God, let's go with God, let's do what He wants us to do. And friend, just like in the book of Ezra, we need to realize when it comes to the work of God, you're never too good to get your hands dirty in the Lord's work. Look in chapter 3. I want you to see what's said in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse number 5. They're rebuilding the wall, and the Bible says this. Next to the people, next to them, the Tekoites made repairs. Now watch this. But their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of the Lord. Friend, that's not a compliment. That's a negative thing of these people. Here are these nobles. They think, they think they're better than everybody else. They're from pure blood. They, they have servants to do that kind of stuff. They think they, that's not the way it works in the church. There's no big me and little you. There's no clergy laity. There's, no, there's not a person who sits in the chief seats and barks out orders to everybody else. That's not the way it works. We're all servants in the kingdom of God. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. If Jesus could get His hands dirty, go about doing good, healing the sick, helping the poor, preaching the gospel, who are we to say that's not our job as well? And thus we must work the works of Him who sent us while it's day. John 9 verse 4, we must be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Here's what we need to do when it comes to the enemies. We need to let God worry about the critics and the naysayers. We just need to stay busy in His work. You know, the idea is this. If people who are critical or naysayers or enemies of God's work, if they can slow us down, if they can get in our head, if, if they can get us upset and angry, they know that's going to thwart the work of God. Here's what they did. Here's what we need to do. They let God worry about those people. They'd stay busy in the work. Look at Nehemiah. I love these words. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4. I want you to read with me verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was furious and very indignant, and he mocked the Jews. Listen to what he says. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, Whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Now listen to this. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads. Give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall. The entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. All these critics, all these naysayers, 
All these people poking fun at them. And here's the extent that they say, this is the sorriest wall we've ever seen. If a fox jumps up on it, the whole thing's going to come down in shambles. And Nehemiah said, we're going to keep working, God. You take care of their criticisms. You take care of the naysaying. You, you deal with them. We're going to stay busy working for you. And friend, that's the mindset we need as Christians today. Are there going to be people who are opposed to what's right? Sure. Are there going to be people who are speaking against what's good and against the church and against the gospel and against Christian living? In the world we live in, it occurs all the time. And if you listen to all that noise, you're going to get distracted. Let God take care of that. You stay busy working in the kingdom of God. Stay focused on what you need to do. But when you work, work with your sword in your hand. Look in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 17. The Bible says, Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other hand they held a weapon. Now, of course, during the time and day and age they were living in, there was a physical threat from the enemy and they would defend themselves on that. But let me ask you this. What's the sword today, spiritually speaking? The Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 17, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. How can I work with the sword in one hand? Are we saying you ought to take up a physical sword and go out and... That's not the idea. But you ought to work with your sword in your hand, spiritually speaking. His Word I have hidden in my heart. Psalm 119, verse 11 through 12. We ought to take the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, Hebrews 4, verse 12, that is able to prick men and women's hearts, and we want to contend for the faith with it, according to Jude, verse 3. And so I want to, I want to know God's Word. I want to have it in my mind. I want to hide it in my heart. I, I, I want to have the mindset that I want to keep that fresh in my mind so that I can stay busy in the work of God and what God wants me to do in this life in trusting and serving Him in every way. And friend, as you do that, please remember, it is God who will stand up for His people. Look in Nehemiah chapter 4, and I want you to watch what's said in verse number 20. Nehemiah chapter 4, look at verse number 20. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, Nehemiah said, because our God, for our God, will fight for us. Who's going to win your battles? Who's going to help you defeat the enemy? Who's going to conquer the critics and the naysayers? God fights for us. Friend, as you study the Bible and as you look at the history of God's dealing with His people, God, when God tells His people to do something and they stay true to that and they keep that message in their heart and in their life and they try to live it out every day, God's going to take care of them. It may not always be in the way we see or the time we see it or you know, we may not understand it some ways. We may not always can see as far ahead as God can. But God fights for His people. And God's going to fight for us. God's going to take care of us. He's not going to leave us forsaken. He's always going to do what's best for His people in spreading the gospel and reaching out to those who are lost. Our responsibility in this is to ask ourselves, what will I be remembered for as a Christian? Look at Nehemiah chapter 5, and I want you to listen to what they said here. Nehemiah chapter 5, I want you to hear what Nehemiah says. Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I've done for the people. When you think of Nehemiah, his name is mentioned in Bible history today. What do we associate with that? Hard work, motivation. Uh, encouraging people, getting his hands dirty, and doing in a few days what people hadn't done in years. Nehemiah is remembered for good because of his faithfulness to God. What about my life and yours? 100 years from now, 50 years from now, when we're long gone, how will we be remembered? By our friends, by our family, by our grandchildren, by those who love the Lord and His kingdom? We want to be remembered for doing good living a good life, 
staying true to the gospel, being busy in the work of the kingdom, trying to save souls and reach out. That's what Christians need to be remembered for in their lives, and that's what will really mount anything in the days ahead. And friend, don't get sidetracked. Don't get sidetracked from the work of the Lord. The world and people in it are going to try to get you confused and get you sidetracked. Don't let that happen. Look at what happened in Nehemiah chapter 6, and let me show you what I'm talking about. Nehemiah chapter 6, I want you to look in verses 1 following. The Bible says, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Gish, and the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, and that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages of the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Now watch what Nehemiah does. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work of God cease while I leave it and go down to you? Of course, we realize and Nehemiah realized this was a trap. But when they said, hey, let's get together. Let's talk about this. You guys look like you're doing a lot of good things. We want to talk about it with you. They meant to do him harm. They probably would have killed him. Nehemiah said, "Uh uh-uh. They said, come to the plains of Ono. And Nehemiah said, no, no, I'm not going over there. Why should I come down from here? And the good work that I'm doing cease while I go over and meet with you. That was only going to stop the work. That was only going to frustrate it. Again, the idea is this. Don't let the world, don't let the things of this world, don't let my purpose and yours is to glorify God. My purpose is to seek first the kingdom of God. My purpose is to obey God's commandments and live according to Him. There's so many things in this world that are pulling at my time, that are pulling at your time. There are so many things that are trying to get us off track from that lofty goal. And I understand you have to do some things. You have to work. You have to provide. I understand all that. But friend, don't let those things get you sidetracked from what's most important, and that is serving God, loving Him, seeking first the kingdom and trying to reach out to the lost with the gospel. Don't get sidetracked by the world or the people of this world. Let's give God's word its rightful place in our lives. I love Nehemiah chapter 8. What a great chapter this is. Turn over to Nehemiah chapter 8 and I want you to see what made the people so successful. In Nehemiah chapter 8, there is now as Ezra... Uh, The scribe and the priest stands up to read the law. Uh, Look in Nehemiah chapter 8 and watch what happens in verse 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And so he begins to read from it. And you notice at the end of verse number 3, The ears of all the people were attentive to that law. Verse number 8, they read distinctly from the book and the law of God. They gave the sense and helped them to understand it. And all the people, they say, amen in essence. Let's do what God said. They're attentive to it. They all stand up when it's opened up. They want to hear more of it. And they say, let's do what God wants us to do in His law. And as you read through the rest of Nehemiah, chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12, the people work diligently. They're all brought back together. The 12 tribes of Israel, they restore the promise as God has given to them. And these people are blessed because of that. They gave God and they gave God's Word its rightful place in their life. They got busy working in the kingdom of God and they didn't let anybody or anything distract them. That's what we need to do today. Let's give God His rightful place, first place in my life and yours. Matthew 6, Let's give God's Word its rightful place in our life in that it's our guide and it's our help in every way. And friend, let's stay busy working in the kingdom of God. One last point that I want to drive home from the book of Nehemiah, and this is kind of how we close today. In Nehemiah chapter 13, there are some people who did some things that weren't right. 
And Nehemiah dealt with that, and he took sin seriously. And I wonder, do we take sin as seriously? Look at Nehemiah 13, verse number 25. Some had married some people they weren't supposed to, and so in verse 25, the Bible says, I contended with them, cursed them, struck some of them, pulled out their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take your daughters for nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. Did not Sodom and king of Israel sin by these things? Nehemiah was can you imagine what's going on here? Nehemiah was serious about this. Pull out his hair, their hair. He's bringing down curses from God on them. Why? So that they don't get caught up in this ungodly action. Why? Because that's what Solomon did. That's what led him astray. They didn't he didn't want them to go down that same path in Israel, to go down that same path back into sin. And friend, he took sin seriously. And we need to do the same today. Do we realize what sin is and what it does to man? Sin separates a man from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Sin causes death. The soul who sins will surely die. Ezekiel 18.4. Do we understand the cost, the price that was paid for sin? Jesus died so that we don't have to live a life of sin, Romans 5, 6 through 8. And do we realize that if we give our lives to Christ, we can be free of sin, we can live a life that brings God honor and glory? You know, we think some of the things Nehemiah did were some pretty extreme measures. But friend, when you think about what sin does to mankind, the people who live in sin and die in sin are going to be lost in hell for eternity, I don't know that those measures were quite so extreme after all. I'm not saying we ought to do physical harm. That's not the idea. But people's attention needs to be gathered up when it comes to how bad sin is and what God did to save them. And so if you're not a Christian, as always, we want to encourage you to obey the gospel. Do you believe in Jesus? John 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin and repentance? Luke 13, 3. Would you make the good confession? Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And would you do what Jesus said to be saved? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the Word of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the